in the introduction. All right. Well, thank you very much, Patty. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, to um, this week's um, lecture at this um, magical um, space, the Aspen Center of Physics. Um, Aspen might not be so magical for those of you who um, live here, um, but uh, coming here for a few weeks is a real highlight in the lives of, um, of many uh, um, in physics. Um, okay, so before I introduce Paul, um, a uh, bit of further thing, um, we request that all participants in this event conduct themselves in a manner that is welcoming to all other participants, treating each other with respect and consideration, due to any form of discrimination for accident. Creating a supportive environment to enable scientific support is central to the mission of the Action Center. All right. Um, on to today's speaker, Paul Goldberg. Um, Paul got his PhD um, from Imperial College London in 1985. Um, and after that, he had a 26 year sojourn at the University of Illinois um, at Urbana Champaign, um, first as a postdoc and then as a professor. While at Urbana, Paul worked on an astonishing variety of topics, writing influential papers on things ranging from polymer physics to quantum entanglement, superconductivity, and atom light interaction. Yes, as a researcher, uh, with his, one of the real masters of um, what he used to call uh, the Urbana style of physics um, that involves um, close collaboration between theory and experiment. I was a graduate student of Paul's, um, and, um, and some of my fondest memories of my graduate education are uh, going to lunch with random experimentalists and learning about some totally new branch of physics over lunch. And then, you know, and then Paul would have something interesting to say about it, not in publishable stuff. So. Yeah, that was, that was wild. Um, anyway, um, so after a long time in Urbana, um, Paul's um, interest uh, branched out beyond research to institutional leadership. And, um, and so he began by founding essentially um, the Institute for Kinetic Theory at Illinois. Um, and was its first director. Um, and in 2012, he left Illinois to go to Georgia Tech, first as department head, and then as dean of the College of Science. Um, then he moved to UT Austin as a dean in 2018, and then to Stony Brook as a provost in 2021. Um, and uh, in, a, in a loss for Stony Brook, I suppose, but like a big gain for our scientific community, Paul has decided to return to doing research full time, and I am thrilled about that. So, um, you know, when I was a grad student, people said, um, go work with Paul, definitely take Paul's classes because he's an amazing lecturer, even when the topic of the lecture isn't quite as salacious as today's. <laughs> um, so I'm delighted to have the opportunity to listen to Paul. So let's Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarang. I, I hope you can all hear me. Thank you very much for this wonderfully kind introduction. I really appreciate it, really appreciate it. And having you as one of my doctoral students at, at uh, Illinois, along with um, the two others in the audience, were amazing highlights of my uh, wonderful years there. Thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, the idea tonight is to have a highly interactive, relaxed, informal conversation. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand or just blurt out a question. You should have a pencil and paper. There are no grades. You won't be taking uh, the papers from you and grading them after we finish. This, the idea is just to have a little uh, fun. So what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about what physicists do behind closed doors. What I mean by that is that you may think that we leap into enormous complex uh, calculations right from the outset. Some of us do, but it's not a good model. The best model is to sit in a coffee shop with a pad of paper and a pencil and scratch your head and think, try and set up a kind of storyboard for what's happening in one problem or another. And that very often involves the art of estimation. And we're gonna have some estimation problems together tonight and involves some very powerful uh, unsung tools. One of them is called dimensional analysis. And we're gonna learn how to do that and try it today you'll see uh, an amazing power within your reach before you leave uh, roughly an hour from now. So that's the basic plan. 
But uh, good scientists are flexible. And given that this week, uh, um, I'm going to try and see if I can turn the page. <coughs> I can't yet. Let me try again. Good. Uh, good scientists are nimble. Come in, find somewhere to sit, please. Just help make, make yourselves at home. As you may know, this Monday, uh, the first data was announced from an amazing project, one of these remarkable examples of humankind across the globe coming together to try and understand this magical universe. And so data was released, in fact, by President Biden just on Monday of uh, data from the James Webb Space Telescope. And I'm just showing you one tiny little glimpse of the data here. What are you looking at? You're looking at a picture of galaxies. Each of those smudges, and they're not smudges, they're wonderfully sharp, are pictures of millions and in fact billions of stars pulled together by their gravitational pull on one another. And so we're looking back here at the most remarkable deep sharp image of our home, the universe, that has been had by humankind to date. And I'll just touch upon a couple of features. I had a tutorial from one of our uh, Aspen members, Suvi um, uh, Ghazari today, who is at the uh, Space Science Telescope Institute and the University of Maryland. She gave me a little bit of a tour as an astronomer through this image, one of many, many, many. But what you can see in the middle here is a cluster of galaxies. You see lots of other galaxies too. Some of them are forming these kind of strange arcs. Those arcs are there because they cut the light from them comes from behind the cluster of galaxies. And that light is being bent by the energy and mass in, those, uh, in that cluster of galaxies, presumably the dark energy and also the mass of the stars and the galaxies all clustered together. One can look in detail at these galaxies and look at the light and spread the light out from them, just as Newton did with a prism long ago. And you can learn which ones are far away because they're moving fast, the expansion of the universe, so their light is kind of stretched and reddened. You can see ones that are nearer as well. And so you can begin to learn about the observable universe. And one of the things that's truly remarkable about this picture that really shocked me is that all this data comes from a tiny sliver of the sky, how little, imagine you held a grain of sand at roughly arm's length and you looked up at the sky. That's the fraction of the sky that you're seeing. And so there's the images from every such grain of sand all the way around the sphere one can collect. So we're going to have data on something like a trillion galaxies in the universe to understand and pick apart learn about our home. Just extraordinarily exciting. Uh, I'm prone to crying and it's experiments like this <laughs> that make me just uh, really believe in humankind. So I think a big round of applause together for NASA and collaborators is warranted. So um, not to be outdone, you may have seen in yesterday's New York Times, web is old news, this is Kate Bieberdorf, who was a colleague of mine when I was the Dean of Natural Science at the University of Texas at Austin. And she is doing remarkable work, exciting the world, including on late night TV, uh, about the wonders of science and drawing people in. And I really admire the work that she has done. And uh, she and I collaborated not so long ago. I volunteered to burn my hands to entertain about a thousand effective students at the University of Texas. And you can see, the fear on my face, but the truth is she's very talented at what she does and it didn't hurt one little bit. It doesn't mean it wasn't scary. So it was exciting to see that. You might want to go back and look at Kate Bieberdorf's work. A word about the Aspen Center for Physics, this magical spot that no one ordered. People got together, had the idea, worked incredibly hard. We have tremendous support from a number of entities, especially the US National Science Foundation and the Simons Foundation and others. And that uh, enables us to congregate here in the summer and to talk and engage and to listen to what's been done and to dream about what we might do 
to find new questions. And I myself have been here for almost three weeks and I'm so excited about the questions that have emerged. I can't wait to take back to Stony Brook and chew on the next year. We inspire one another, we spark creativity, we have an absolutely marvelous time. And I have to say this, this particular place is one of the most important ingredients in the world of theoretical physics around the entire globe. I won't go through the kind of things that have been touched on this summer, but you can just see the range and the importance of the questions that get wrestled with here. So thank you to all of you for engaging with Aspen and um, we value your support immensely. I'm going to go behind closed doors in just a minute and see what physicists really do, but I want to touch upon something that's sometimes overlooked. When I think about what it means to be a scientist, I feel like I'm incredibly fortunate because I get to live a life in which I get to try to get to, together creativity on the one hand, tremendous imagination from some of our most talented colleagues, together with reason, we have to be constrained by what we understand about the world today and the kind of results that kind out of experiment and we put those two things together creativity and reason and we stir them around in our minds and our computers and out if we're lucky and things that are not just impactful they don't just change the world and enable us to have better car tires or faster computers but very often they are also ideas and results of great beauty every now and again even high watermarks of human thought and it's a great privilege to be engaged in a life of science I want to touch upon one of the most marvelous examples, and we're going back now to the year of the Civil War, the year the Civil War started in the United States. This is a fellow named James Clark Maxwell, known to some of you, but not all. Um, when you look at these equations, I don't want you to be concerned if they don't speak to you or even sing to you. Imagine that you can't read music and somebody showed you a sheet music uh, and you knew it was a beautiful piece of music. And have the same feeling about these. When physicists and mathematicians look at these equations that were set forth by James Clark Maxwell, aged 29, uh, he really set the world on fire. And in some ways, this is really the dawn of the modern age. When I look at Maxwell's equations, and I'll tell you what they mean in a second, I find myself thinking about beautiful things in the world like the Taj Mahal. And so I'm going to ask you, what is it? you feel when you look at the Taj Mahal? What do you see? What goes on in your minds? Symmetry, yeah. What else? Beauty, grandiosity, yeah. Dome, yeah. Detail. Detail, a kind of harmony. When I look at it, um, I don't see anything that feels superfluous. Everything that's there sort of feels like it should be, and there doesn't seem to be anything missing. It's quite a, 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 an art for an architect. And there's also this false symmetry in the pond here. That isn't really there, and sometimes in physics we get misled by false symmetries. When we look at Maxwell's equations, we feel the same way as physicists. So what do they tell us? The first one tells us that if you have some electric charge in the universe, then there are electric fields that are uh, radiating out from it. The second one tells us that there would be magnetic fields radiating out from magnetic monopoles, but we don't think there are any, or at least we haven't found any yet. The third one tells us that if somewhere in the universe, magnetic fields are changing in time, we must have electric fields. The last one tells us if, that if we have currents of charge going down a wire, say, and we have magnetic fields. And some of you will have seen an experiment where there's a current through a wire and uh, there's a, uh, a compass and the compass deflects its needle. Now, this was known and along came Maxwell and he said, there's something missing. It's sort of as if one of these towers perhaps weren't there. And he thought deeply and he said, well, maybe there's a phenomenon in physics that people haven't noticed yet. Maybe not only could a current electric current create a magnetic field, but maybe a time varying electric field could also give rise to a magnetic field. And once he had that idea, everything changed because now for the first time in human history, he understood what light was. So light is the idea that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field and that changing electric field 
creates a magnetic field and you don't need an antenna or a charge anywhere nearby. The two just handshake their way through, this, through space all the way through the cosmos. Now that's not all. I'll let you just glance at this list of things that come out of thinking about electromagnetism a la Maxwell, light and all its siblings across the spectrum from uh, radio all the way through to gamma rays and everything in between. Uh, lasers and LEDs, MRI scanners, to understand solids, materials going outwards to planets and galaxies in the cosmos, going inwards to nuclei, to quarks, and also even a kind of mathematical framework, a guide that kind of begins to point the way what we call the standard model of elementary particle physics with the quarks and gluons and other particles that you have heard of. And a great intellectual inspiration led Einstein, who was an enormous fan of Maxwell's, towards theory of relativity. That's what we mean when we think about beauty on the one hand, impact on the other. And I'm not sure there'll ever be an example quite as glorious as Maxwell. So what is it that we do as physicists, as theoretical physicists? Well, we reflect on data that comes from experiments and we look for patterns and principles, calculate to see if our theories are consistent with the experiments. And sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Sometimes we are inclined towards suggesting new experiments and predicting outcomes. But before we do heavy duty calculations, get out our sketch pad and we, we stand at the board and we play and we think and we estimate and we use dimensional analysis the tools we try to end up with that kind of hollywood storyboard that tells us where the movie's going without the detailed script so that's sort of what we're up to and you might say well in many settings we know the basic equations so why don't you just calculate there's two reasons why we don't immediately do that first is that very often in fact almost always for systems that we're interested in computations are just too hard to do straightforwardly. One needs to have some understanding in order to ferret out results. And secondly, equally importantly, we're after understanding, not just numbers. And so it's very important for us to get a feel for what's going on. And today we're going to learn how this is get a feel. So here's an example why things are just too hard to face directly. On this wall here is a beautiful but incredibly compact expression of Albert Einstein's theory of gravity, space, and time, or his general theory of relativity. In a nutshell, as John Archibald Wheeler said, matter and energy, and they're encoded in the right-hand side, tell space and time how to curve, it's encoded in the left-hand side, and, and the curvature of space and time tell matter and energy how to move. But buried under this elegant simplicity, are incredibly complicated equations that we're unable to solve. And we might, for example, want to understand how two black holes collide and merge just as they did, as we observed in the very first data from the laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory, but it's really, really hard. So having some understanding to guide you before you calculate is a good idea. So let's begin with some estimates. Time to take out your pencils and paper. We're going to look at Fermi problems. This is Enrico Fermi. Any of you will have heard of him, a great 20th century physicist, um, master theorist, master experimentalist, quite a remarkable human being. He loved this kind of problem. So we're going to do one that's attributed to him. I ask only one thing, which is that you swear off Google at least for the next uh, 45 minutes. So I'm going to ask you to estimate, and this is attributed to Fermi, how many piano tuners there are in the city of Chicago? And I'm not going to say anything more for a little while. So off you go. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves and uh, see if you can come up with a number. Chicago. <laughs> are allowed to guess. But it's better to estimate. <laughs> Thank 
Anybody feel ready to just volunteer an, an answer, or a guess, an estimate? A thousand. Let's see. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Very good. So we have quite a range there. Yeah. Very good. Interesting. Five. Five. Very good. Twelve hundred. Good. We've covered a fair amount of ground. I don't know the answer. We don't get the yellow pages from Chicago anymore. But let's have a look at the way a physicist would tackle this problem. So first of all, we've got to figure out how many people there are in Chicago. We've got to figure out how many people there are per home. That I looked up about 2.6. So we can figure out that there's roughly one and a half million homes in Chicago. Next bit was the roughest bit for me. I'm not sure I'm confident at all. I reckon that there are about one in 20 homes as a piano tuned about once a year. One of the funny things about making estimates is you often make errors, but some of them cancel. So you end up being better than you ought to. So we can figure out that with one and a half million homes, one in 20 getting uh, uh, tuned once a year, we've got about 75,000 tunings per year. And I imagined I was a piano tuner. I'm going to work about 50 weeks a year. Maybe it's 40, maybe it's 60, doesn't really matter. I work five days a week, not seven. I'm not a physicist. <laughs> and I know that I really want to do more than two pianos a day. So that tells us that a piano tuner can do about 500 pianos a year. So I divide 75,000 by 500 and I get about 150 piano tuners. So somewhere around here was something very, well, I say good, I just mean in agreement with me. Um, <laughs> But that's the kind of way we proceed. We don't really worry about whether this is one or five. We just sort of get a ballpark. We end up with the right kind of number. That's our first example of a Fermi problem. Let's try another one. So you know, it's a little bit of a misfortune that every time your car tire goes around, it leaves a little bit of itself on the road. If it didn't, it wouldn't wear out. The question is, how much does it leave on a road? How many sheets of atoms get left on the road every time a car tire goes round? I'm going to tell you one number. All atoms, roughly speaking, are about 10 to the power minus 10 meters in size. Sure. All atoms. Roughly speaking, 10 to the minus 10 meters, that's a tenth of a thousandth of a millionth of a meter. We will do this one together. So let's, let's see what happens. So when your tire goes from brand new to you uh, throwing it away or recycling it, Roughly how much does it shrink in radius? <laughs> Great, we've got four millimeters over here. I'm gonna say one centimeter because I don't mind whether it's four millimeters or eight or 12. I'm gonna say it's gonna wear out in 100,000 kilometers which is some number of miles, 50, 60,000, something like that. I think those are roughly how long tires last. Again, I'm going to quibble about factors of two. Now, how far round is, if you walked around a tire, would it go? It's not 10 meters, it's not 10 centimeters, probably about a meter. So we'll pick that. So we know now, or are able to work out how many times the car tire goes round before you get rid of it, because it's the since you go in meters, not kilometers, divided by the circumference, meters, and here's what we get. We get 100 million into the power eight times the wheel goes round. And during that time, 
we agreed that it lost about a centimeter. So if it loses a centimeter over this number of revolutions, it loses 100 millionth of a centimeter every time it goes round, roughly. So how big is that number? A centimeter divided by 100 million into the minus 10 meters. And I said at the beginning that all atoms are roughly into the minus 10 meters. And so it seems that it's, and it's not crazy that every time a car tire goes round, it kind of just leaves the sort of minimum it can without leaving nothing, namely a kind of sheet of atoms. And if it were a very different number, like a thousandth or a thousand, sort of begin to think, well, I need a theory for that, but this is at least comfortable. I haven't tried this with the manufacturer, car tire manufacturers, maybe I should. It's a reasonable kind of answer. And by the way, I've tried to give citations and at the end I'll give a little list of reading for people who might want to try some of these ideas elsewhere. Who's this? In Franklin. <laughs> so here's another Fermi type problem, although it predates Fermi by quite some time. Franklin spent time in London. He lived near a place called Clapham and there's a very famous pond in Clapham. Franklin did an experiment. He got some oil about a teaspoonful, he spread it out into the pond and it kind of spread out over a fraction of the pond. He was an observant, thoughtful person. He noticed that the ripples on the pond kind of quietened down. And he made the hypothesis that they were quietened down in the region that was covered by oil. Then he made one other hypothesis that the layer of oil on the water was just one molecule thick. Later, when you're allowed to connect with Google again, you can have a look at the molecular structure of, let's say, olive oil, and you'll see that it's a moderately big molecule with quite a few atoms in it. So Franklin was able to figure out one hypothesis, namely that you've got one a molecular sheet on top of Clapham Pond, how big a molecule was. So let's do this one together. So a teaspoonful of oil, according to Franklin, about five cubic centimeters. And then he could see the pond and could survey, and he figured out that this oil covered an area of about 2,000 square meters. And so he was able, with the volume and the area, to get the thickness, because you all know that the thickness and the area gives the volume. You know the volume, you know the area, divide the volume by the area and we get the thickness. Lo and behold, what comes out is about 25 atoms in size, which is pretty sensible. When you look at an oil molecule, you can see that it's kind of 25 atoms across, mostly carbons and hydrogens and some oxygens. And that is um, Franklin's ability to estimate the size of a molecule. Well, the next idea that I'd like to touch upon also goes back in history uh, to Galileo, who wondered why it was that we didn't have supergiant animals. We're now going to see why we don't have supergiant animals. So here's an elephant. Let me say that it has a size, I'll call it L. I'll, how long is an element, elephant from tail to trunk? Maybe two meters? I'm not quite sure. We'll call it L. We want to think about the properties of the elephant if all we did was scale everything up from three meters to six or from L to two L. And this process of scaling up from something to twice something is something we're going to do a fair bit going forward. So there's our smaller and our larger elephant. And what Galileo realized was that the weight of an elephant, when you double its size, was up not by a factor of two or four, but a factor of eight. If you like, we can see why a little bit later on. He also realized that the strength of an elephant when you went from size L to two L, and not by a factor of two or eight, but by a factor of four. The reason is that to break the elephant, you need to break the bones. And to break the bones, you need to create a sheet between one side and the other, which has an area, not a volume. And the area of the bones doubles, the cross-sectional area doubles when you go up from elephants of size three to size six meters, let's say. 
So you can see that every time you double the size of the elephant, its strength to weight ratio halves. One part went up by eight, one part went up by four. And there's a mismatch. So if we keep going, what we'll do is exponentially worsen this ratio and eventually the elephant would collapse under its own weight. So a beautiful argument why we don't have super giant animals. I, I think I'll skip the explanation of why eight and four. Yes, please. Why didn't dinosaurs collapse? Aha, very good question. So dinosaurs, uh, great question. Why, why do you think they didn't collapse? So they were strong, they were big, they spent a lot of time often in water to support their weight, and they didn't go far along this pathway, they weren't even bigger because of this kind of mechanism. Lovely question, thank you. So we looked at things doubling, we looked at things going up by four and by eight. Maybe we can have changes with scale and are not governed by integers. This idea was made famous by a mathematician, French mathematician, Benoit Mandelbrot in the second half of the 20th century. So we're gonna have a look at strange scalings that don't go quite like the ones we just looked at. Uh, length squared for the bone strength, length cubed for the mass. This geometrical object has a name, it's called a Szepinski gasket after the Polish mathematician. And we're gonna ask the question, if we double the side of this Sharpinsky gasket, by how much does the amount of white paint we need to paint the white areas of an originally yellow triangle? We're going to find a strange result. Before we do, I just want to remind you what happens in uncomplicated settings. I'm not sure why we're skipping over the slide that I want. We'll go here. So let's suppose we have a rod. We want to paint the outside of the rod and we're not going to worry about the end. And we double its length. We know that the amount of paint for the twice as long a rod is two times as much paint, one for this half and one for this half, as it was for the length L rod. What about if we had a sheet and we're not going to worry about the edges of the sheet? If we want to double the size and paint it, we need four times as much paint as we did before. We can use these two results to say that the amount of paint goes like the length of the rod to the first power or the side of the sheet to the second power. We're gonna find a strange situation where we have power between one and three, which tells us that Sherpinski's gasket is not a one-dimensional thing. It's not a two-dimensional thing but it's something in between. So let's have a look and see how that argument goes. What we do, we take the gasket and we imagine this pattern going down all the way ad infinitum to the smaller scales. And we imagine patching together four triangles make a Sherpinski gasket twice the size of the one that we originally started. Well, how much paint do we need? Well, we need as much paint as we need for a Sharpinsky gasket of side L three times, but not four times, because we're not painting the central one. And if you look at all these patterns in every triangle, you see the same recurring pattern all the way down. We know that the amount of paint to paint the white areas on the side 2L Sharpinsky gasket is three times, one, two, three, the amount of paint in each of these. And it's not terribly hard, although we don't need to do it now, to convince yourself that, that means that the amount of paint goes like the side to a power. The power is not one for a rod or two for a sheet, but it turns out to be a ratio of logarithms and it's about one and a half. So this odd object, is one of the first objects known in mathematics to have a dimension that is not a whole number. That's Sherpinsky's gasket. And ideas like this pop up very beautifully all over physics and led, have, has led to a number of Nobel Prizes. The last major idea for today is called dimensional analysis. It goes back to Fourier, and some of you will know the name Fourier, the person who 
uh, understood a great deal about how heat flows, but also understood that signals could be decomposed into perfect waves of different wavelengths that then could be added together to reconstruct the original signal. So that's Fourier. An idea of his that people don't talk about as being credited to him, but was, but we talk about every day, is something called dimensional analysis. And let me try and explain it to you. So here's an equation that you've all heard of. Einstein's famous energy is mass times the speed of light squared. And I was out running with a friend of mine in Atlanta a few years ago, and he said, why isn't it E equals MC cubed? And I thought, what an interesting question. Physicists probably wouldn't ask that. And it led to a lovely conversation about this idea of dimensional analysis. This equation, as you know, is at the root of things like nuclear power and nuclear energy and a great deal of other phenomena in physics in which energy gets converted into mass or mass gets converted into energy. And just as an aside, let me just ask you to feel how bizarre it is that a theory would have a, a speed in it. When you're looking at a car moving along the street, don't say, well, nature sort of limits that or says that it has to have a certain value. You imagine all possible values for speed. But in fact, nature comes with a characteristic speed or the speed of light. We're going to come back to this strange event in physics where things that you didn't think had a scale actually have a scale. And we'll see that in the context of quantum mechanics. So here's energy as mass times the speed of light. And Fourier's observation was that objects come with what are called units. Here's a mass, here's a speed squared. And you all know that speeds are lengths divided by times, miles per hour, meter per second. It turns out that the units on either side have to balance in a physics equation, because if they didn't and you change the units, the prediction would be different. But the experiment doesn't know that you're using meters rather than inches, so the result surely can't. So the units have to balance, and let's see that they do. So on, in the middle here, we have a mass. We have a speed, a length divided by a time squared. What about the left-hand side? Well, that's an energy. Energy is about forces moving objects through a distance, force times distance. And forces, as we know from Newton, are to do with masses times accelerations. So if we put those objects together, a force times a distance or a mass times an acceleration times a distance, the bundle of units is exactly the same on the left and right hand side. If we had mc cubed, it wouldn't be. mc squared is how we are. Now, we could have had a pi here or something else, but that could have been massaged away by choosing different units. <laughs> We're going to use that incredibly powerful tool to figure out how long it takes for a pendulum to swing back and forth. So we're going to make an estimate using dimensional analysis, and let's see how it goes. What do you think the time it takes for the pendulum to go back and forth depends on? Length of the L. We've got weight. We've got. If you don't mind, I'm going to call it mass, not weight. But yeah. yeah. Friction, I'm going to ignore. That's the kind of thing we do as theorists because they're inconvenient. <laughs> A little clue here. Gravity, yeah. So we've got the ingredients, and we're going to guess the duration of the swing depends on the mass and the length and the, the strength of gravity, each to its own power. So here's our assumption. The duration is like the mass to some power times the length to some power times the strength of gravity to some power. And we're going to choose A, B, and C, to make sure the mass, length, and time on either side match. And I'm not going to make you do linear algebra in public. I wouldn't do it in public either. That's there. <laughs> At the end of the day, what you find is the following result. Whoever said mass, actually, it doesn't depend on the mass. Zero. Length square root, gravity in the denominator square root. Actually, the fact that it doesn't depend on mass, I'll just say this, every time a physicist finds zero, he or she should say, hang on a minute, that's serious. <laughs> and in fact, it's incredibly serious. And this is actually what, in some sense, led Einstein to his general theory of relativity. He said, hmm, when I think of mass to do with gravity, have the same mass as when I think of mass to do with inertia, resisting motion. 
And he had the strength of mind and character to say, it must be the same thing. From there unfolded the general theory of relativity. A little bit more modest here, but we're learning that the duration goes something like the length divided by rotational acceleration, and we've thrown out gravity. We've th thrown out the mass of the string. We've kept things as simple as we can. We get the right answer, but we miss a simple factor. It's about, it's two pi, so it's about six. But still, if you wanted to know whether the answer was a year, or you wanted to know whether the answer was a microsecond, this would help you. Yes? Um, does the gravity's force on the object change based, based on the height of the object? Like, does gravity have more effect on it if the item is higher or lower? A lovely question. What do you think? I think it would, but I'm not sure. Great question. So near to the Earth's surface, because the Earth is big and pretty flat, but gravity doesn't change very much as you go up. But if you go quite a long way up, it gets weaker and weaker. And we could then try and figure out how to include that effect. And so you, you've spotted a approximation or an idealization that I had not even thought of, hadn't mentioned. So when we put numbers in, you're going to put in a length of about three meters and gravity's strength is about an acceleration of 10 meters per second per second. We get an answer for a three meter pendulum to swing back and forth about every half a second. It's actually not right. It's about three seconds, but it's still pretty good. You didn't actually solve any differential equations. We just did arithmetic. So I think that's a win. Let's try some others. Looking at Turkey. All right. So we're going to try and figure out how the time it takes to cook a turkey depends on the mass of the turkey. What do you think? Double the mass, double the time. Exponential. Got exponential as an idea. We have a logarithm as an idea. We're going to see that it's not quite linear. So let's make that argument. The time it takes to cook a turkey is the time it takes to get the turkey up to a certain temperature. It depends on various things. It depends on the mass of the turkey and the density of the turkey. You could trade those in for the mass and the size, for example, but it's convenient to take the mass and the density. And then a property of turkey meat, the thermal diffusivity, which is the answer to the question, if I create a temperature difference, hot and cold, how quickly does heat flow from hot to cold? And turkeys have a number most physicists don't know it, but I looked it up, uh, that will give us an answer. So we're going to guess that the time it takes to cook a turkey goes like the density to some power times the thermal diffusivity to some power times the mass of the turkey to some power. Let's try and think a little bit about why. Well, the lower the density of the turkey, the bigger it will be for a given mass, so the further the heat has to go, so that should slow the turkey cooking down. Bigger than mass seems to suggest the longer the time. And the thermal diffusivity is important too. If that's a big number, the heat will go in quickly. We can use dimensional analysis to get this time, and we're going to do that. Again, a little bit of linear algebra, but we'll put it to one side. And the answer that comes out is density to the minus two thirds. It's kind of interesting because densities know about volumes and two thirds powers turn volumes into areas, which kind of makes sense because the oven is heating the turkey through its surface area. High thermal diffusivity will shorten the cooking time. Here's the surprise. Mass comes in like a two thirds power. So we're going to assume that the other parts stay constant and we're going to say, let's suppose we wanted to cook a turkey that was eight times as big turns out that it only takes twice as long. And if you look in a high quality cookbook, the cooking time for a turkey as a function of its mass has a little bit of curvature associated with the fact that this power law is two thirds and not one. We're going to wrap up dimensional analysis by looking at a very uh, important example that caused a national security crisis. So this is uh, G.I. Taylor, a remarkable, wonderful 20th century scientist, uh, was, for example, sent to uh, understand why the Titanic sunk, the first person to look at velocity autocorrelations as a property of 
a wind flows, and many, many other important problems in the flows of fluids and the properties of uh, solids. Uh, really a great science. So in skilled hands like uh, Taylor's, uh, Taylor was able to infer, as we shall see, the yield of a nuclear explosion from a photograph pub published in a magazine. So here's the photograph published in a magazine of a fireball. And what we're told is that this length scale is about 100 meters. We're told that the photo is taken about 0 0.025 seconds after the explosion. So this photo was published in Life magazine. And Taylor said, and in fact, he already knew it, that the energy released at time at a certain time goes like the radius to a power, time to a power, and the density of air to a power. And then he used our friend dimensional analysis to work out A, B, and C. We won't do it. But this is what he got. The energy released goes like the radius of the fireball to the fifth power, density of air to the first power divided by the time squared. And when he put the numbers in, he got 100 million million joules, which is equivalent to about 25 kilotons of TNT. And the official military estimate made in a much more elaborate way gave somewhere something like 21 kilotons. So you can see that in skilled hands, the publication of a picture with no other information, say security et, was unacknowledged at the time. So that's what physicists do behind closed doors. We make estimates, we use dimensional analysis, we make simple uh, uh, estimates of what we can neglect and what we need to include and we build them together. Just try and get a feel for what's going on before we go in really deeply to the hardcore stuff. As I said a little while ago, these ideas of scaling have played an incredibly important role all the way from the interactions between quarks inside subnuclear particles um, uh, through the magnetization of magnets and enormous other parts of modern physics. So let me wrap up where I began with the last example. I'm going to talk about quantum mechanics, and we're going to figure out how big atoms are. So I mentioned a little while ago this shocker that nature comes with a speed limit. When I look at a car moving along a street, I imagine that it could move at any speed. I don't get any sense that something is going on in nature that says that may be true at low speeds, but something different happens at high speeds. It was Einstein's genius to understand that time was relative that unlocked the conundrums that were in place uh, before him. Here's another one, actually predates Einstein's relativity. It's Max Planck, night before a conference in which he was to talk about the physics of something called black body radiation. And he was in a panic because his theoretical work didn't fit the data. So he made a bold and wild leap under pressure to say, in modern language, that nature has another constant it's not a pure number and it's not a speed, but it's an angular momentum. So what's an angular momentum? You all have in your mind's eye the image of a skater who pulls in his or her arms and spins faster or pushes the arms out and spins slower. The reason for that is that to a very good approximation, the angular momentum of the skater is constant. And by the way, that's a consequence of the fact that the laws of nature are the same in all directions, which is quite a striking uh, terrestrial consequence of something really quite grand. So it turns out that Planck's constant has the units of an angular momentum. Momentum is a mass times a velocity. An angular momentum is a mass times a velocity times a length. Um, so nature comes with a built-in angular momentum. When we look at the skater spinning, you don't say, oh, the skater can have uh, a million or a million and one or a million and two lumps of angular momentum because the numbers are so big that we don't see the graininess. When we get down to the scale of atoms, it turns out that Planck, Planck's constant, together with the mass of the electron and, and, and the forces going on in atoms, are just right to say that their angular momentum is really lumpy and it can't come in arbitrary amounts if I measure it 
I get answers that are either whole numbers of this Planck's constant or, or half integers, like three halves or five halves. We don't get other things. It's quite astonishing. So armed with this observation that in the atomic world, there's some scale of angular momenta, we're able to estimate the size of an atom. And this is the last thing we'll do. We're gonna guess that an atom has a size that depends on its mass to a power, times Planck's constant to a power, times the strength of the force that pulls the electron towards the nucleus, which is called Coulomb's law, expressed in a somewhat unusual way. So in order to get a length, the size of an atom, I need to tune these exponents, these dimensions, A, B, and C, there's a little bit of linear algebra. When the dust settles, I get certain results, I put in the known numbers for the mass, the strength of the Coulomb force and Planck's constant, and lo and behold, out comes not one times 10 to the minus 10, which is where we started. And if I'd played around, I would have got that, but then you would have known I was cheating. On the other hand, we've got a number that is very close to the number we talked about when we talked about car tires, uh, as an estimate for the size of atoms. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm just gonna leave you with a little bit of a reading list. I'll leave this up uh, and I am more than happy to take any questions or hear any comments that you wish. Thank you very much. Yes. Like in the example you gave about the car tires, so if all these cars are leaving a sheet of atoms, you would think over some period of time, and maybe the time is just so long, that, you know, you think that there's some buildup of atoms on the road that you, the road would be much higher, but because they're so small, that, that length of time is too long for us to observe. Is that what's happening there? Great question. I don't actually know the answer. My guess is that when the rain comes, it also washes things away. I don't think the rubber adheres that well. And in fact, we'd be worried if it did and we'd make our tires out of something else because a very adherent uh, adhesive surface probably would make our tires wear out even sooner. Interesting. Yes, here and then here, please. No. Thank you. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they're the same order of magnitude. They might be smaller by a bit. They might be bigger than by a bit. They're all roughly the same size within a factor of about 10. Do. It certainly does. Absolutely. And so one would have to make a model much more refined to see that. But as you put more electrons in, you also increase the charge on the nucleus, which pulls them in tighter. So a little bit of a compensating effect going on there. Thank you. That's exactly the right kind of question to ask. Thank you. But here and then here. Would it be possible to like, there would be like half an atom of residue. Like, is it possible for an atom to split just naturally? It's a lovely question. So. So this is a really good piece of science here, which is that it is possible for atoms to split, and they do, and that's, for example, what happens when you have a nuclear power plant or, uh, God forbid, a, a, a nuclear weapon. However, the kind of forces and temperatures and so forth involved in most people's driving is such that those processes are just way, way out of, uh, out of the realm. Uh, by the way, natural radioactivity also involves atoms changing, um, but, uh, but those kind of effects are relatively small compared with the breaking of chemical bonds, which is what's involved in leaving atoms on the road. Not the diameter, correct? Does it matter? So, so that's a lovely question. When you're doing this kind of level of estimation, the difference between a diameter and a radius is a factor of two. I'm not going to offer to buy you lunch over a factor of two. <laughs> <laughs> Would you care to speculate, since you began with this example of the James Webb um, telescope, of what that instrument might discover that would adjust or upend our perception of the universe? 
Um, actually, no. I mean, I think one of the joys of science is just to see what unfolds and our imagination is usually far too feeble compared with what comes from an experiment. But I do think we will understand, for example, um, the yardsticks that we use to understand the um, uh, growth of the cosmos, of the universe, uh, because we will understand things like supernovas better. So the supernovas are the candles or the yardsticks that allow us to understand uh, the acceleration, uh, the, excuse me, the expansion of the universe. But if we understand those yardsticks better, we'll be in a better position. And let me also say, I'm not an astronomer. <laughs> I encourage you to invite astronomers to come here and talk to you about the prospects for Webb because it's a remarkable, remarkable instrument. Thank you. Do you know what path Webb is currently taking for taking shots or it's just tennis? I don't know. Well, the great thing about 2022 is that you can Google it. And, and, and NASA and collaborators are masters at the art connecting with the public so i spent a little bit of time googling around yesterday and today and it's already just overwhelmingly rich but they're also pedagogical so you can read and understand i can read and even understand what's going on so it's quite a delight so i encourage you one of the tv networks today had its entire backdrop as images from hubble that really moved me that said to me that we're in the public consciousness and that's a great place for us to be yes you know, if a photo like that is a snapshot or a big long exposure. So I don't know, uh, but I seem to remember that the time it took to collect the image I showed you is something like minutes compared with days that it would have been in the past. Yeah, as opposed to Hubble, which was about, you know, like eight days or something. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, I don't know about you, but every time I write a computer code, it doesn't work the first time. Our web had to work and it had something like 300 separate points of failure, every one of which would have killed the whole thing. And it worked. So it's really a miracle of cooperation of humankind in a wonderful way that again will make me teary. Other comments or questions? Oh, please. I can start with the Big Bang. <laughs> uh, yes, except. <laughs> Of course, we don't know. This is our best current theory. Uh, apparently, Stephen Hawking was once asked a question along these lines, and he responded uh, with a question, which is, what's north of the North Pole? <laughs> and this is a really nice way to think about what happens to time as you go back in the early universe. It's a comforting answer. <laughs> Any more questions or comments? Yes. I have a question. Not about what we were talking here directly. But I see on the internet a claim that the electrons flow through a copper conductor in a wire. It doesn't go through the wire, but along the surface around the electron. Is that true? Depends on the frequency. If it's an AC current, it may go on the surface or not. There's something called well, the skin depth. Uh, and it depends on the size of the wire. But in certain circumstances, yes, it flows down the outside of the wire for reasons of actually Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell's electrodynamics. So, so it's moved to have the far less copper than the same distance as the wire? Uh, I imagine so, but I never thought about it. And I will go and think about it because I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. It's not a question, it's just a comment. I just want to thank you. I thought this was so great, these Fermi problems to help us understand how you all think. Well, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Yes, here. Looking around, Aspen, you see flower, gorgeous flowers, low visible spectrum. Are there any flowers that are outside the visible spectrum? <laughs> Actually, they all are. You just don't see it. So, so in a way, then you have to ask yourself, what does color mean? And it's associated with sending in white light and having some color absorbed and some color reflected. And that can happen anywhere in the spectrum. It depends on the chemical composition, sometimes on the bonds. So the answer is yes. And I'm going to even say, and this may sound grandiose, one of the joys of being a physicist or a scientist is that you see the world outside of the visible spectrum, not with your own eyes, of course, but with fancy equipment. It's very enriching 
on the one hand, I might go and see a ballet and see a pas de deux. Another day, I might be thinking about the dance of two electrons in a chemical bond. So yes, the world is as beautiful and rich outside this sort of narrow sliver that we see. Not everybody has the good fortune or the opportunity to see it. Uh, well, uh, since I was about 12, the reason is that I wanted to be an architect, but I couldn't draw freehand. And so the next thing seemed to be physics. And, uh, and I will give you a very honest answer that when you're 12 or 13 or 14, you say to your parents' friends that you want to be a theoretical physicist. Oh boy, do they gush. So that positive feedback stayed with me and I somehow stuck with it. <laughs> Anything else, folks? Yes. So when you have a magnetic field or whatever mm -hmm. and an electric field, how does that create light? And when, with planets that have magnetic fields, how do those planets not create light, light themselves? Gosh. Wow. <laughs> so what a marvelous question. And so, so um, the short and cheap answer is they do, but not in the range of the spectrum that you see with your eyes. Uh, and again, there's this one little point, which is that it's changing magnetic fields that cause electric fields and changing electric fields that cause magnetic fields. But I'm going to give you an analogy. Think of a swing or a pendulum. So what's happening? So at the so at the top of the swing, what's happened to the motion? <coughs> Stop. So the object doesn't have any energy of motion. We say it doesn't have any kinetic energy. Because it's ridden up in a gravitational field, it has what we call potential energy. And that potential energy causes the mass to then begin accelerating down the bottom of the swing where it has lots of speed and therefore lots of kinetic energy, but less potential energy. And there is a kind of shaking back and forth that doesn't require anybody to be pushing, hand shaking back and forth. So the changing potential energy causes kinetic energy and the changing kinetic energy causes potential energy. And in any respect, that's exactly what's happening with electromagnetism. You have a changing electric field that causes a changing magnetic field that causes a changing electric field, and that can rush all the way through an atom, or it could rush all the way through a cosmos until it arrives at some charges and currents which can act as a sink and kind of absorb them. Thank you. Let's take one more. Is it surprising, uh, looking at that uh, photograph of these uh, galaxies, that light is able to travel so far. I don't know whether I would say surprising, but it's, it is somehow wonderful <laughs> because um, I suppose the question is what would stop it? What tends to stop it is that the, the light comes along with its electric field, somehow more important than the magnetic field usually, then there's some matter in the way, but there isn't that much matter between us and the source. And then what happens is that, el that electric field grabs hold of the electrons in the matter and the nuclei, and it sort of pulls and pushes them, and that, that absorbs some of the energy. So you have to have stuff in the way in order to absorb. And I guess the point is that in some circumstances, there's not much in the way, and we get to see. When you look at other web pictures, you'll see glorious situations, light, coming through or coming from enormous clouds of dust and matter in the cosmos that has, have not condensed to form things like stars and planets and black holes and absorb and have an impact on the spectrum. There was a period in the early universe, in fact, when the electrons and the protons had not condensed to form hydrogen. And that's very hard for light to get through because of the easy shaking of the electrons for any light to come through. Thank you. One more, and then we'll see. <laughs> there is indeed something called dark matter. Indeed. Uh, yes, it, uh, as far as I know, its primary effect is to say that if there's dark matter, that's matter, and it has mass and it has energy, it bends the starlight. In fact, the bending of the starlight is a diagnostic it's called gravitational lensing 
that we can use to back out the distribution of dark matter and other matter in these clusters of galaxies. Thanks very much, folks. See you soon.